If you do a search for a homemade version of the double slit experiment, you'll find a good number of incredible videos on do-it-yourself versions of it, where all that is required is a very affordable laser and other simple materials to generate the interference pattern. However, if what we want instead is to perform the quantum version of this experiment, where we send a single particle through the slits one at a time, we would need significantly more sophisticated and expensive equipment to create a very precise and robust setup. Unless, of course, we use what we learned in the previous video and map the double slit experiment onto a quantum circuit. This will allow us to execute an almost identical version of this experiment on real quantum hardware. Now, at first glance, this might seem like a cheat, but I can't emphasize this enough. As we will see next, this is just like performing a homemade version of the quantum double set experiment. The difference here is that we're turning a hardware problem into a software problem, which we can then execute by remotely accessing a quantum processing unit instead of having to build the setup ourselves. So in this video, we will show how to implement the circuit we previously described using Qiskit, which is a Python-based open source quantum computing library. And then we will execute our circuit on an IBM superconducting based quantum processor. Now, even if you don't have much programming experience, I would still recommend you stick around, see the results, and convince yourself of how incredible it is that we live at a point in time where executing true quantum experiments like this is within the reach of almost anyone. So let's get to it. As we previously mentioned, we're going to be implementing our quantum circuit version of the double slit experiment using Qiskit, which is a Python based quantum computing library. Now, if you're new to Qiskit, I have posted some links in the video description below with resources on how to get started. I will also be posting links to this code we're going to cover today in case you're interested. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to import this quantum circuit class from Qiskit and this transpile function. This will allow us to implement the circuit itself and then the transpile function we'll discuss in a minute. We're also going to import this parameter class which allows us to add variables to our circuit. Now, if you remember, our circuit has this variable phi, which we need to assign values to. So this is what this parameter class would allow us to do. And lastly, we're going to import a simulator so we can run our circuit on our personal computer before executing it on a real quantum processor or QPU. And then we also need to import uh, NumPy and matplotlib so we can visualize our results. So first I'm just gonna do a couple of simple definitions. We're just going to assign the value of pi to this Greek letter pi and then uh, define our uh, parameter phi. And then we can construct our quantum circuit by just using one qubit and one classical bit to store our measurement results. And if you recall, we have a Hadamard gate applied to qubit zero, our phase gate with our parameter phi, and then another Hadamard gate. And then we just measure our qubit. So if we draw this circuit, we see that it resembles what we had covered before. Now, what we need to do next is transpile our circuit. So transpiling basically implies taking the instructions we have, so our quantum gates, and translating them into another instruction that our simulator can interpret. Now, these gates are simple enough that maybe we don't need to transpile our circuit, but this is good practice uh, to do anyway. And as we will see when we run this on a real QPU, this is a very important step that always needs to be performed. So after transpiling our circuit, what we need to do is replace the values of phi with the different angles to cover the whole span of the screen. So let's pick, for example, a large number of uh, points. So in this case, uh, 8,192. And this number might seem arbitrary, but it is common to use powers of two to do this. So this is two to the 13. And then 
Let's select a screen span of 6 pi. That way we'll have a large enough of a range to see the interference pattern. Now we need to generate a list of the points in the screen we want to run the circuit for. So let's just uniformly pick these values at random so we get a good coverage over the whole screen. Now, as we will see later, due to limitations in what we can execute on a real quantum processor, we'll have to change this a bit. For, but for now, let's just pick these values uh, at random uniformly from minus three pi, so half of the screen span to three pi, which is the other half of the six pi. And then finally, we need to create a list of circuits and assign each of these randomly selected values of phi, which we're gonna do here with a for loop. And then if we just pick a random one of these circuits and draw it, let's say circuit number six, we see that we get the same circuit we had before, but where this phi has been replaced with some value. So if we pick another number, let's say circuit eight, we should get a completely different value for that phase. Now we can run our simulation and execute the total number of circuits. So in this case, we have 8,192 circuits and run each of them just one time and then we can store our results. Now recall that in our circuit model, measuring a zero corresponds to measuring a particle hit the screen in the corresponding value of phi. So we need to post process our results to only select the values of phi for which we measure a zero in the total executions. So we're going to do this with another for loop where we're just gonna store the values where we had a hit on the screen on this other list. And then with this, we can plot our data and see we get the expected interference pattern. Now, what we have in this plot is the total number of particles that hit the screen in some particular region of that value phi. But we can also emulate how our screen would look like by, for example, arbitrarily selecting a value for the Z coordinate of that screen and then just plotting each individual point from the simulation. And here we can see more clearly that interference pattern. Now to run this on a real quantum processor, we need to make a small modification. So before we uniformly pick the values of phi at random, but if we take a look at the limitations for what we can execute in a real quantum processor, we see that we can only run a maximum of 100 circuits. And in the simulation we just run, we had a total of 8,192 circuits. So what we need to do is now take the total span of our screen and divide it up into the maximum number of executions we can do, so 100 circuits, and then run each of these circuits a few hundreds of times to collect enough statistics to get our results. So here we do this with a very similar code to the one we had before, but now we're running only 100 circuits, but each of them is going to get executed 512 times. And again, if we just pick one of those circuits at random, we can see that it's been assigned some phase value. Then we just execute our simulation and then pause process our results to select only the results where we measured a zero. Now, if we plot this again, we can see the interference pattern, but it's a little bit more uniform because we didn't pick the numbers at random, but we picked equally separated values that we execute the same number of times. So if we look again at an emulated version of what the screen would look like, we can now clearly see this discretization in the separation between the points in the screen because we're executing 512 times the circuit associated with this value of phi, and then we move to the next circuit that has an incremental value of phi, run it again for 512 times and so on. But at the end, this doesn't matter because we can still clearly see that interference pattern. So now to run this in real quantum hardware, we need to do a couple of 
more imports, we're going to import this IBM provider that will give us access to the real quantum processor and then some other functions just to monitor how things are moving. So here we're going to select one of IBM's quantum processor. So here we're picking IBM Lagos and then we're just displaying the name again to make sure that we import it correctly. Next, we're just gonna take our circuit and transpile it again, but now we need to transpile it so it matches the instructions available in the real quantum processor instead of our simulator. And very similarly to what we did before, we're going to assign each of the values of phi to now our newly transpiled circuit. And then if we draw that, we can see that we have a total number of six qubits, even though we're only using one of them. And this correspond to each of the available qubits in the real quantum processor. So here we can see there's a total of uh, seven qubits for this particular one, but we're only using here qubit zero. And then with that, all we need to do is just execute our 100 circuits, each for a total number of 512 shots, and then look at the status. And here we can see that our job has been queued. Now, this can take several hours, so we're gonna pause the video here, and then once the results are available, we'll take a look and see how things differ from what we run in the simulator. So our job seems to have completed, so we can now look at the status and see that it has successfully run. It took about two and a half hours to execute. So now we can, just like we did with the simulation, extract our results and post process our data to only select those outcomes where we got a zero. And same as before, we plot the distribution of particles hitting the screen at a given value of phi. Now, what we can see here is that unlike our simulation, the qubits in a real quantum processor are noisy, so they're going to have some errors. And we can see that here, when we look at the values of minus pi and pi, where we are supposed to get zero outcomes, but we still see some amount of particles hitting the screen at those locations. So here we can see we have executed a version of the double slit experiment on a real quantum processor and extracted the results. Now, the last thing I want to do is just go over the version of this experiment where we actually measure the particle right at the slits. So we covered this in the previous video. All we need to do is modify our quantum circuit to perform a measurement right after putting the state in a superposition of going through the top slit or the bottom slit. And we can just execute the simulation the same way we did it for the other version of the experiment. Pause process the data. But now when we plot the results, we can see that our interference pattern has been completely destroyed. So performing that measurement prevents the wave of the particle from interfering with itself. Similarly, if we look at the emulation of the hits on the screen, we see that they uniformly land at any given location, just like we had derived in the previous video. Now, one thing that might feel a bit unsatisfactory about our implementation of the double slit experiment using quantum circuits is that instead of having a continuous wave function reaching the screen in a superposition over all possible values of Y, here we have to run separate quantum circuits for each value of phi. So phi itself is not really in a superposition of different values. Now, this issue can actually be alleviated by modifying our circuit to use a series of auxiliary qubits that control some phase gates, allowing to place our quantum state in a superposition of incremental values of phi. We will need a separate video to cover all the details of how this works. But for those of you interested, I've also added a separate notebook with the code necessary to implement this version of the experiment. So I hope this video was helpful and in the next one, we'll finally dive into the delay choice quantum eraser. And after that, we'll do the mapping to a quantum circuit, just like we did for the double slit experiment.